I just started it and it is recording. <laughs> so just in the nick of time, uh, nice to meet you, Felix. I'm Karen. Hello. Oh, yes. Hello. <laughs> and everybody else knows each other, right? Yes. We do. We've been yes. interacting via email, Felix. So I'm I'm happy we could finally get you logged in. So for folks who are jumping on right now, I'll just say we're having a little bit of technical issues. And so we're happy everybody's here. Welcome to Millicent Unplugged. Um, so first I wanna just do a land acknowledgement that we at the Millicent Rogers Museum are located on the traditional lands of the Tiwa speaking people known today as the Red Willow people of Taos Pueblo. We continually strive to deepen our relationship with the Taos Pueblo through collaboration of events, board representation, and exhibition space. And we honor the people who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. So thank you, we're happy you've joined us. And tonight's topic is passion for fashion, Dene Couture Design. And joining us are Penny Singer. Penny lives in Albuquerque and is an award-winning fashion designer who learned to stitch at her mother's knee and continued self-taught to bring the imagery and emotion of place and tradition to the realm of wearable art. And tonight, <laughs> Penny is actually physically located um, at the state line of Arizona and New Mexico. So we've had a little bit of um, challenge getting to a good space where the connections come in well and looking great, Penny. So welcome. Yeah. And Felix Earl of the Navajo Nation who makes his home in Ganado, Arizona. Felix is a man of many artistic talents that express the life ways and identity of the Dene people. So welcome Felix, we're happy to jump into conversation with you all. And I'd like to thank my friend and moderator, Sarah Francis, who is always with us, <laughs> helping the conversation move along. And before we get started officially on this conversation, Sarah, I wanna say I spent some time on your website today and uh, yes, <laughs> I know. And so I really want to encourage people to check out Sarah's website, photomirage.com, because she is a master photographer, award-winning author, and she's got some great content on her website. And Sarah, what I noticed today, sorry for this little aside, but the photo and the, the caption that says, um, Adobe Pueblos are not green. I loved that because from a photographer standpoint, it's like, hey, what's up? Let's check this out and make sure we're being responsible with our photography, right? And so I'm sure you've got a lot of great tips. Well, yes, and, and the green part <laughs> is the color, not, the, not that they are not green construction. <laughs> I know, you were talking, it was talking shop with photographers, right? Exactly. Yes. So, so I might want to rethink just exactly how that's worded. <laughs> I thought it was, it really like, jumped out and captured my attention and I am not a photographer but I knew exactly what you were saying so <laughs> kudos anyway well, thank you, thank you. Uh -huh. yes and, and, and everybody I I'd be happy to uh welcome you to my website <laughs> photomirage.com so without well, further ado that was an unintended little plug so let's talk fashion let right? us indeed talk fashion now um if I may start Felix, we have had hours of conversation about you, yes, grandmama, and your aunties. And so I feel like I know many of them, though some of them have passed. And so if I may, because we're going to talk to them in just a moment, Penny, tell us about your heritage, your family. You, I know you have inherited skill and instruction from your uh, antecedents also. So start off with telling us about your moms. About my, my mom? Yes. Or, oh, okay. Well, um, it, it, it's a lot. Um, with, with the way I grew up, my dad was in the service. So um, my mom, she sewed a lot. You know, she made my grand, my mom, her mom's traditional outfits. And I never really... Um, 
thought, you know, sewing was going to be my future as um, I can remember being seven um, at that time, I think we're in, in Japan or not um, in Florida and my mom sewed, you know, she made clothes and stuff like that. So I kind of learned fun, the fundamentals of the machines from her. And um, I made like little like figurines, like, you know, pillows, just the easy stitch of learning how to sew. Um, other than that, you know, my, um, my mom, she sewed, she weaved a little, my grandmother was um, a weaver. And that's how she provided for family here. So I could just say sewing just happened. It wasn't intentionally there. And I've always been a creative um, art, you know, I may be artist. I always dabbled with art, like to draw with stuff. But um, as far as sewing, I just learned the fundamentals from my mom. And I used to, you know, like make pillow, pillow cases. Um, teddy bears, sew little clothes for my dolls and stuff like that, you know, I mean, but sewing was pretty much self-taught and learning from my mom. I, well, now that's really interesting because Felix, on the other hand, knew practically from the beginning, and that's a picture I hope is your grandmama. Yes, that's my grandmother. Uh, you knew right from the beginning, and all these women just kind of gathered around you and and brought you up in in the whole industry and the artisan uh so it, how many women did you have at your beck and call after <laughs> all well um well uh well well first of all let, let me start off by introducing myself to everyone that's listening in and say hi to penny how are you doing i feel i'm doing time. great you're yeah, on the rest. <laughs> same here yeah so it's really good to see you um to and then like also you. hello to everyone else yeah hey um let me just introduce myself really quickly um yeah it's a shay felix earl who is uh to the team in still come behind us this team uh sinna jenny that's a che ado uh better jenny that's a good i uh the national uh look on kd uh masha ado um what's i thought i you see yeah that just in k god could i add that nasha so um Hello, everybody. Greetings. Um, my name is Felix Earl. I am of the uh, Bitterwater clan, um, born for the Water's Edge clan. My maternal grandfathers are the Black Streak running into the Water clan. And then also my paternal grandfathers are the Black Streak clan. So that's how I introduce myself to the universe as I did in person. So um, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you all for tuning in and listening. So um, with uh, Sarah just asking me the question there, um, uh, about the women that influenced uh, my my life, um, I would have to say it is um, far and foremost is my grandmother, um, which is pictured down there with Sarah, um, the little lady there in the purple top, the purple velveteen top, and all the jewelry decked out. That's uh, my grandmother. Her name is Helen Cornfields, and um, uh, she raised me um, along with her. Um, she had two older sisters at the time, um, Mary Jeanette Yazzie, and then also Irene LaRose, who was the eldest. Uh, and then, um, of course, there was my mother. Um, my mother was always in the picture, uh, too. Uh, but my mother was did not at the time. Um, she had, there's eight of us all together. I had seven siblings. Uh, and um, the four youngest were with my mother. And then the four oldest were with my, gra my grandmother. So, uh, and then also I had a, a bunch of aunties. I had an auntie, an, el an, el an elder auntie named uh, Mary Louise LaRose, who also really, um, had, had a huge uh, hand in um, helping raise a lot of us um, grandchildren. So, um, but uh, that's where uh, a lot of my influence came on is from my, my grandmothers and my aunties and my mother. So uh, mostly my grandmothers. Um, so um, my, uh, my uh, introduction into uh, fashion started with my grandmothers. Uh, my grandmothers were dressmakers. So they made all their own clothing uh, for ceremony, for social events and things like that. So um, they all um, uh, had um, the, the old um, singer sewing machines, the ones that you pedal. So um, as long as I can, you know, remember, my grandmother would say that I would get propped up underneath the sewing machines in my cradle board and I would sit there and I guess just listen. I don't remember that, but the youngest, uh, the the earliest, I think um, I can recollect was actually sitting underneath the sewing machines and just watching these women pedal. 
So that's like my earliest memory of it. Wow. And just listening to the machines going and going. And as of course, as I got older, um, my grandmother's, you know, said, you know, you're old enough, don't just sit there, pedal for us now. So I went from that, just observing to pedaling for them. Then from there, just, you know, um, you know, uh, learning a lot more after that. I, I learned how to use a sewing, sewing machine from them. And then also um, pattern drafting. Um, I learned how to fold um, different types of fabric. I learned about different types of fabric, um, how to cut them. Um, I learned how to draft patterns by folding pieces, big, large pieces of fabric like origami and then making one straight cut line and then unfolding it. And then you get a full round skirt. Just a lot of things like that, like pulling, you know, little tiny, fraying the edges of fabric and pulling threads out to make, you know, if you didn't have a ruler, that's how they would cut straight lines. All these other tricks, you know, that my grandmothers knew how to do. So I learned from them. So I learned very, very, very early. And uh, that's where um, my influence from um, clothing comes from. So uh, with fashion comes from. And, and then and, and on top of that, just um, my grandmas were really social. So um, it wasn't just about fashion. It was about the whole appearance, you know, um, with makeup with hair and things like that too so my grandmother's wore makeup so <laughs> and I yeah and that's where my interest in makeup came into play too and then also with hair too so um my grandmother's the oldest one was the only one that wore the traditional Navajo hair bun um my other grandma Mary had a huge beehive and then also my grandmother had a smaller beehive so it was just kind of like this fold back and forth. They had all had long hair, but and they also had extensions too. So and I was completely fascinated by just watching these women get ready and create and everything from the clothing to the makeup to the hair and then also to the attitude. So and um, you know, I was a little kid and I was really proud of my grandmothers. I mean, when we showed up at events, ceremony, I mean, we we walked in and I was like, Yeah, these are my grandmothers. Uh -huh. So that's a lot where my influence comes from. <laughs> wow. That's a very powerful, powerful story. I want to ask Penny, so kind of along those same lines, your designs, let me go back to where your, to your um, background that I had, are so powerfully geometric and the, and the colors in them. And wow. I, I want to ask you, um, how the influences of the land um, also are emerging through your designs? <clears throat> well, just recently, I, I, well, not just recently, maybe for the past, maybe three, two years, I've been with what I call Diné life, mm -hmm. uh, Diné uh, culture, um, just like with the, the capes, when I designed the capes, when you see landscape in them, those are just geometric designs that I apply to the garments. So like I'm telling a story or it's just um, from what I'm visually learning on my own. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was somewhat brought up, but very minimally traditional. So I'm kind of teaching myself, you know, things. So I guess that's where it, you know, emerges through my garments. Um, like the geometric designs, um, like the, the, the tall mesas, or it could just be something flat or the mountain, a real, you know, simple silhouette design of the mountain. Mm -hmm. um, so when I design the capes, I get more, it's kind of like a, an open canvas to where I can just you know, design, you know, a big bold design or do more intricate designs into it. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, just like when I do like, you know, with the landscapes or visuals, you know, I, I'm telling stories also. Yeah. It seems to me that your varied um, uh, locations as a, uh, an armed for, for <laughs> armed forces child, moving around you got yeah. influences from a lot of different places did you tell me you were someplace in the orient at one point or um where there were a lot of oriental people because um, i do see some okay. influence in your yeah. in your vests and capes yeah see like 
I mean, influences to me has started maybe as when I was young, you know, not knowing what I, where I'm going or what direction I'm doing. And I also, I have, um, I mean, like I, I tell people my life is complicated because, <laughs> yes. you know, I am Navajo, but um, I wasn't raised in traditional, you know, ways, but I, I learned a lot from my grandmother being here. But being young, you know, I grew up in Japan. So being in Japan, my, that's where I was like in my toddler years. So maybe seeing, you know, their their style of clothing when we went to performances or anything like that, maybe that's kind of embedded in me, but I don't know. Um, and then, you know, from there I was in Florida, you know, maybe in, after my toddler. And then I came back to here to New Mexico and I was partially, you know, here in New Mexico. Then my dad would TDY for a while. And then we lived here on the reservation with my grandmother. So um, it's just kind of hard to just kind of say where, where I am pretty much grounded, but I feel here at my grandmother's place, this is where I'm at. And, you know, being here, I'm just, again, teaching myself a lot of things mm -hmm. and I have good, you know, relatives here to learn. So, yes. I mean, you know, you know, just my, my, it's just, everything is so hard <laughs> to like say, oh, you know, I, I, I'm here, I grew up here, but then I was only here temporarily until we moved. It seems to me that the experimentation that both of you show so different in your designs that um, regardless of the upbringing or the place, you both have things that just flowed out of the spirit, flowed out yeah. of the, the various influences. And um, Felix, I know you as a rather spiritual person, or I feel that and the times that we have talked and been together, that that is something quite important in your life. And, and mm. going for, um, talk to me, uh, uh, we, we spoke briefly of this before, but how you talk to your potential client who comes and wants a particular garment, maybe for an exhibition or maybe for a certain ceremony and how you get the spirit of that person before you even begin to design? Um, well, uh, for me, the, the, I have many different ways to approach um, anything. And then even with uh, my fashion designing, I, I find that there's lots of ways to approach it um, and not just one way. So um, mostly right now, um, what, I, what I focus on is I, I focus mostly on just custom designs. Um, I can put out ideas. I do put out the ideas occasionally, like if there's something that I've seen or something that I get inspired or, um, and I just, I have this itching that I have to put some beauty out there and create something, I'll put it out there and then just let it go. Um, and for the most, most, most time, um, a lot of the clients that do come to me will already have some sort of idea um, that they want or something that they've seen that maybe I've created or maybe someone else have created or maybe they saw something somewhere so they'll come to me and they'll ask like okay um I've seen this I want something like this but um I really would want you to put your stamp on it and then a lot of the times a lot of my clients especially my repeat clients come back and say I want your construction like that's what I'm after is your construction. Um, and um, from for Earl Couture, that's what I'm known for is my construction and my my tailoring. And mm -hmm. you know, so that's really important to me. So um, I kind of approach fashion as like an architect of for the human body. So that's um, what a lot of my clientele come back for is just because of that. A lot of the, the clothing that you'll see like on the photos of like um of like on my site, you'll see them. They're very form fitting, really close to the body. Um, a lot of these garments are only made for just that one specific person. So, if there's someone else in the world that can that has a body like you, you know the exact same measurements as you, then they'll be able to fit it. But most of the time, that won't happen. So, um, taking that approach um, sometimes uh, and focusing just on that. 
Um, I mean, I have some dresses that look simple, but it'll consist of like 15 panels of the pattern, you know? Like, I don't know if you see this dress behind me here, this gown, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this gown is like about 87 panels all sewn together. So, um, and it's, it looks really uncomfortable and it probably is really uncomfortable. A lot of the models that squeeze into that gown <laughs> will be like, oh my gosh, you know? And, you know, and when we get the zippers up and then we get the, the, the backs tied up, you know, um, it's just, for me, you know, um, when I approach designing like that and then I get that reaction when the client puts it on, you know, and they see themselves and they'd be like, oh my gosh, I, I never imagined myself to, to, you know, to be, you know, wear something like this or to be in something like this. And then it, for them, it gives them, I, I like to say, I like to give them the experience. Um, you know, for me, um, at times fashion is just fashion. It could be, but then at the same time, going back to watching my grandmothers, you know, get dolled up clothing, makeup, hair, everything, and they create this thing. And then they create this image and they put it out there. I always used to get this high watching these women like, oh, you know, I would just be in awe, like, oh my gosh, these are angels, you know, coming down from the heavens and whatnot. And I like to repeat that experience for myself and then also for my clients too. So, and then when they do, do go through that experience, they say like, you know, they'll be like so appreciative and they'll be in awe and they'll realize like, oh my gosh, I just, I didn't realize all this work, consciousness and thought and even prayer and even song at times goes into creating these garments. So like with what um, you guys were talking with Penny earlier is about a, a lot of her work that has all those ge geometric designs and that she pulls from the environment surrounding her and her, her applique work, you know, she's known for her applique work. And I'm always mind, this is my mind gets blown with all the work, all the applique that she does, because I've done applique before and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, this is a lot of work. <laughs> so kudos to, to Penny, you know, it's, she she just amazes me just how many garments she puts out and with the applique work on there. But you know, Girl. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, keep going. Yeah, yeah so that's yeah, all things. Like that. Yeah, so things like that, you know, it just really, like I said, you know, I approach it in many different ways, just depending on how the client come to me and what they want, and then if they see something that I've completely designed from sketch all the way to. Um, to a to uh, to getting it out the door, um, if they come and see me about that, and then I'll be like, okay, well, you know, I can re recreate in a way. Um, but most of the time, when someone comes to me and wants something that I've designed, we usually end up in the in the end, kind of maybe tweaking it a bit, recreating something, kind of giving them the client like a personal their their own personal touch to it at the same time. And I think the customers and the clients really do appreciate when I do that for them. Mm -hmm. So that's usually how I approach the, the design process. And like I said earlier, you know, there, there, there are song and prayers and there's actually a lot of consciousness and intention that goes into your creating. So um, when I do do that, um, I was uh, like in, a, in an interview, uh, I was telling Sarah before that um, when I do do that, I actually, in a way, when I complete a design for somebody, I kind of have to let it go. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've worked on that for, you know, I put all my my thought process and everything into it. And I probably, I put some, you know, um, my songs, prayers into it. And then at the end, I, I have to let it go. And I, my grandmother was a weaver too. And she would say that when she finished a, 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 a weaving, she would have to let that weaving go and let it out into the world and be like, okay, I'm letting you go now. You're releasing you out into the world. You belong to somebody else. So that's the same process I go through mm -hmm. when I create. So, yeah. This is so different because Penny, you work almost like a painter because you've, you've taken your fabric and you're styling and you're creating a canvas out of it. And yet, do I understand that mostly when you do shows like at Tesoro and Santa Fe, uh, that you do not know who your client will be? Is that true? Well, I have a wide range of clients um, as far as like when I go to art shows, um, I've got followers, I've got collectors and um, 
they always look to see what I got next or what's going to be coming. And I mean, my clients can be from youth to, to the elders. And um, just like with the garments, I don't specifically, you know, design for, for a certain like style or um, like another nation. It's just mixed. Um, but I do custom orders. Like if they request something, I can design for them. Like if they want, like with all the designs I do, it's very open to other native um, like designs. Um, Cause when I first started, I, I designed um, dance regalia for my son and his dad. So that's where the applique work began. So um, I taught myself the applique and then from there, that's kind of where that evolved from. So when, when I design, I was trying to figure out, you know, what to design or what am I going to do? So in the beginning, it was kind of more Southern with the, with the tweak of geometric designs that I applied to. But now it's, it's very um, like open and wearable art. I design kind of more in apparel, like jackets, shirts, um, accessories, because it's kind of easier for me to, to design for that type of client, you know, clients that um, admire native clothing. And it's kind of easier to um, design like a jacket or a vest and put designs onto. So as far as my clients, you know, you know, I, I do have, you know, a small clientele that collects my works from when I first started. And tell, it's us kinda, more, it, it, tell us more about the dance regalia for your uh -huh. son and his dad. Um, mm -hmm. What what do they dance? What what are well? Their it was um, like long ago, but uh, my son still dances, and I still make his clothing. But it's the applique work for the Southern Plains. It's um, in the powwow, it's uh, Southern traditional, Southern traditional, you know, type of clothing, which my son is Ponca. So being out there in, in the Kansas area and Oklahoma area, um, that's, um, it's called ribbon work. So ribbon work is a different, it's an older style where they fold, you know, the satin or the taffeta, they fold, they iron and they straight stitch the edges. But now, um, you know, now it's kind of more applique where what I do is I cut the design out and I lay, I infuse it on the garment and then I zigzag stitch. And, you know, that's where the apple, that's kind of what I, where I'm known for is the applique work. But um, just designing, I, I mean, it's not just a straight dance regalia outfit and when you go to powwows you see like amazing applique work that family members have signed for themselves and family but for myself I just you know do it in more in a contemporary form I, I don't use traditional design I like to use fun wearable art like you know turtle design horse design buffaloes and then sometimes I'll incorporate just a little bit of beadwork I mean that's kind of like not in my traditional ways, but it's it's art for my you know for what I do and what I apply to my garments. So we could even say that that was a layering of material as well as the styling. And so there is uh, obviously a clothing piece is dimensional, but this is an added dimensional that that gives a a feeling, and that goes right along with your use of the geometric designs that. Mm -hmm. speak to the mountains, speak to the lakes, speak to the trees. Yeah, and when I started to make my jackets, I had to figure out a material that's going to not be, you know, heavyweight, like applying one design over and applique in it. So I didn't choose to what use like a midweight wool, which Pendleton used, or a heavyweight. I found a um, wool, which is called flannel wool. And that's pretty much my staple material that I use. And I buy those in bolts. And then um, with that, that's how I was able to apply a design over it and not and it not be so like stiff. Like when you wear it, it's not gonna be heavy and you know, um, like stiff. The flannel wool really lays good. It's very lightweight, and, um, like a wool. 
and it's good for what I do for in my jackets, which I'm known for, you know, with the applique jackets, you know, I have different themes for them, but, um, but yeah, it just took some time, you know, to figure out which material I was going to use when I first started to make the jackets, which I'm known for in my designs and in the, in the jackets and the capes. And now I'm kind of venturing out with other designs, but, um, Pretty much all the jackets I make, they're they're all handmade. I cut and I lay the applique down and freehand applique it. It's like drawing. It's like drawing on fabric. Is how I tell people because I I that's what I said. You did your. Yeah. It's a canvas just like yeah. a, a painter would use. And there's nothing worse than going to buy a, a handmade jacket and the thing is so heavy that mm -hmm. you know you won't wear it, that the only thing yeah. you can do is put it on the wall. Uh, <laughs> like, oh, well, it's a wall. We, <laughs> yeah. we had several of Penny's jackets here during, it was a couple of years ago, I think, during the Southwest um, Artisan Show, I think it was. And they do have such a nice weight to them and they are very soft. There's nothing stiff about it. And I'm curious to ask you, Penny, because I know you, you shifted gears and you started making masks and your masks um, were doing really well throughout the pandemic. So, but I'm curious if you, did you do applique on any of those? Well, yeah, I mean, during the pandemic, it was, it was just a crazy time, you know, nothing was going on where I were isolated at that time, you know, I did take, you know, I was taking care of my parents, but I had a studio. Yeah. So I'd go back and forth. And I, um, with everything shut down, with the mask, I had so much extra material. And then when I when I did a show at the herd, the last show, that's when the pandemic was to begin. Mm -hmm. Some um, people had asked if I made masks, and I'm like, for what? Because <laughs> I didn't know what was coming. Yeah. I mean, when before before a show, I'm a hermit. I'm like isolated for a couple of months. And the only thing I do is either design or listen to music and stuff like that. But as far as making the mask, I did make some masks. I did applique some. And then during the mid time of the pandemic, that's when materials was very limited. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I outsourced everything I could make, you know, mask out of, you know, out of all my scrap material. I mm -hmm. ran out, but it kept me busy. Yeah. I had a fun time with it. And um, I did velvet mask and this and that, but... I mean, it was just the time to like, what do I do now? You know, everyone's like, oh, you can do this and do that. And I'm like, well, what do I do then? You know, there's nowhere to show it. So just mask was just something to do. Yeah. And I probably made about, I don't know how many masks. It was crazy. Probably about 2,000. Wow. I don't know. <laughs> that wow. is a lot. Uh, yeah. Now, Penny, you just said a magic word because we've got to ask Felix about velvet and working with velvet because that that's a whole job in itself, as I understand. Um, yeah, so um, velvet. So um, I work with a lot of velvet, um, a lot of different types of velvet, synthetic and then also natural. Um, yeah, as Sarah mentioned there, yeah, it's like you're working with velvet in itself is, is really can get really difficult at times, especially it gets difficult when you have to work um, with velvet. They call it um, a pile and the pile is the thickness of the, um, of the, the fibers that are sticking. It's kind of like a carpet, if you will, like carpet. So they call that the pile. So the higher the pile, the more difficult it is to work with. And then also the more synthetic um, I guess, yeah, I would, I would say, um, like, uh, inexpensive and synthetic to that gets even harder to work with. Say if you take acetate for, for example, like an acetate velvet that has a large pile is just completely horrible to work with. <laughs> I refuse to work with that. I'm, when people bring me the acetate, I'm like, you know, no, we can't do this. I'm sorry. Because what I have to do is I have to, um, what I'll, I'll if they just absolutely don't have anything else, I say I have to um, I have to use interfacing, adhesive interfacing, to effuse to the backs of the, this type of fabric, so it's easier to work with, and I don't completely destroy the fabric. So, um, and then I tell, well, in order for me to do that, it's going to be cotton, and then cotton is pretty expensive, and it's an adhesive cotton, and then the price of that will probably double 
you know so you know things like that and just you know uh, and then like there's like you know like you take for example with karen the the um the little uh the outfit in the back behind her on her screen mm -hmm. that's one of the, the the navajo traditional um uh um outfits that uh that i create well you know something like that the the top part of it is velvet and it's a um um it is a uh it is a, a polyester fabric but the pile on that is really 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 short and then um it is stretchy it's one of those stretch of uh, vel stretch of velour type of um polyesters that is actually i had to um i had to fuse the cotton um the, the woven cotton um um uh, stabilizer on the back of that also too and that for me just makes it easier to work with so you work you find ways to work with it um for me, the best type of uh, velvet that I love to work with is I like to work with um, with a blended fi um, blended fiber, if you will, like rayons. Rayons actually really good. Um, it's plant based. If you can get a little bit of cotton blended into it, it's even better. So <laughs> things like that. So as a designer and working with velvet and working with different types of fabric, you also there's there's like subcategories. You know, there's like you know there's velvet and there's natural velvets like silk and cottons which are really awesome and they're so pretty and then you have the synthetic velvets and then under synthetic you have rain you know you know you have like polyester you have acetate you have all different types of blends you have plant-based materials like um like the rayon and then you know and under that there's a lot more like um categories that fall underneath that so um but yeah like um velvet i work with it all the time um, I've gotten used to it, so um, yeah. So, and and as a fashion designer, it's really important to know your types of fabrics, all different types of fabrics. Um, Penny mentioned the wool that she works with, you know, things like that. You you know, there's so many different types of wool. So um, yeah, but that's 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 how I I get through it. And you know, the best way to learn is just to go in and just learn from trial and error, and you'll find out you know what works best for you and things that you know. Uh, and especially, and then also your machine comes into play too. So knowing your machine and working it and using different types of fabrics with the machines that you have also is really important. Where do you source your materials? Uh, that's a question for both of you. So jump in. Okay, then, well, uh, Penny, you want to go first? You can go, Felix. Okay, well, um, okay, sourcing my materials, um, sourcing fabrics, okay. I source fabrics from everywhere you can imagine. Um, the, when I very first began my um, my um, my career into fashion, a lot of the fabrics that I sourced were from actually from ceremony. So my family are they're really um, deeply involved in um, Navajo ancestral and traditional ceremony. So in ceremony, the Net people will barter with fabrics and with fibers, so um, and blankets, trade blankets. So a lot of the the, the 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 fabrics that I started off with and the raw materials I started with were actually obtained from um, uh, from ceremonies. You know, um, my parents collecting them, uh, relatives collecting them. They would just bring them over. I say, I have this. It's just sitting around. Do you, you think you can use it? I'm like, yeah, sure, just give them to me. And then that's where I accumulated a lot of my fabrics from and learning about different types of fabric. And then right now, um, I source a lot from local retailers. Um, uh, I live in Ganado, Arizona. So we have like uh, fabric shops um, like on the reservation and also off the reservation in border towns. So I'll, um, a lot of fabric shops I'll source from there. And then also I do um, source from online too. If I'm looking for something really specific, I'll go online and I've actually had some fabrics, you know, shipped in from China. So, um, you know, things like that. So it's it, right today. It's just like, you know, anywhere, any, you know, if you're looking for something really specific, that's, you know, just go online and you'll find something. And it's crazy too, because sometimes you'll think, okay, I don't think I'll find that locally. But if you go online and Google something, you'll be surprised like, oh my gosh, they have that like in a near town. I can go to that, you know, the nearest <laughs> border town. And they have the fabric there. So, you know, so, but for me, it's, it's, it's that's how it started off for me. And then right now I just, you know, I, I source it everywhere and then of course like with the velvet and the print cottons that were, were um that the navajo Diné people are known to work with a lot um a lot of that is provided on the reservation through retailers so um they stock up on uh, velvet 
I mean, every oh, wow. type of velvet, every color you can imagine, and then prints, you know, calico, cotton prints, everything like that, quilting prints, stuff like that. You know, they, they really do keep us well stocked on the reservation. So. <laughs> Understood. Well, Penny, you said you buy your wools in in large quantity, obviously, because so many of your garments require quite a bit of fabric. Um, where where do you get yours? Well, um, that one I looked into, and you know, this was like years ago, so um, I found it through on the website. And, oh no no no! Okay okay, let's throw let's go back a little bit. Okay, my source of material began when I used to work at Hancock Fabrics in Albuquerque. Oh, wow. And again, this is where my self, self-teaching, what I didn't know at, you know, then is just, it just happens. Everything I was, I was around or where I worked was either art or um, in the beginning, just, you know, you're a teenager, you work here and there. But I used to work at a place that's called Hancock Fabrics. And I worked there for maybe about a good five, four years. And it was part-time. And this is when I wasn't designing, but this is just, you know, a job that I had. And again, you know, be, you know my mom being a seamstress and, you know, making clothes and stuff like that. Um, that's where I learned the um, different types of fabrics. So that flannel wool, I remembered, you know, back then, um, that I like, I like that um, the texture and the feel of it. And at Hancock's, they did have it. And I, I went back over there and I looked at it. And the way I source out my materials is I look on the box and they have all the information. You pull down on the fabric and it has all the information there. So instead of buying retail, then that's when I started to buy wholesale. And the wholesale, that's where I found out where this, this wool was being um, manufactured or sold at wholesale. And that was out of LA. So at that time, that's how I resource my material or during giveaways or somebody will give me a fabric. But I always like to stay with what I work with. And that's like with cotton, calico, and velvet. Um, a while back, I mean, this was kind of when I started. I used to like to work with a rayon velvet. I used to um, do, um, I used to make my own designs out of wood. I would cut the design out of wood. I, I mean, I would show you, but it's in the studio. But um, I would um, I would do burnouts with that rayon velvet. And my, the source I found that out again was when I worked at Hancock. I liked the feel of this rayon velvet. And from there, I actually, um, they said I can do a burnout with it. So what you do is you lay the fabric down and you can, um, with the iron, you, you impress that design onto the velvet. And it's a one-time shot. Like if you do it, you mess up, then you can't fix it. It's already burnt into the velvet. So the, I mean, those are just like, I mean, these, these, those, the velvets I used to do, that was back then. I'm kind of probably going to re redo those, bring those back. But as far as the source of the material, it's just, you know, by travels or, you know, when I used to work at Hancock, but, you know, you go, and even at Joann's, you know, you go look at fabrics that, like, you know, you just look and then that's again, instead of paying retail, if you want to buy bolt or stay with that same material, you, you know, you could just look at the information on the box that they roll the material on. But a lot of times I think they're not doing that anymore. I think they're finally getting <laughs> what we're doing <laughs> but that's kind of like how I um I get my material I like to stay with the same material I use because it's easier for me to work with I mean I can work with the, you know so many materials but there's just things I can't applicate because if I do silk or anything fine material then it's going to um compress into the fabric and it's going to get bulky or it's going to tear into the fabric you know, because when you zig, when I zigzag and I applique, it's a very um, tight little stitch where it zigzags and it, it could either bunch up or just cut a hole into the material. But, um, but yeah, so that's kind of like, you know, what we do as, I guess, designers, like it could be different for others, but, you know, our sources could be at the fabric store or our local place here on the res. I know some trading posts have the velvet, have the calico, um, but, you know, 
but like, you know, for me, whenever I travel, I like to go to different um, outlets for fabric. Of and one course. place in uh, Phoenix that I like to go to is called SAS. It's, oh, yeah. a, big, it's a big um, <laughs> fabric place. I mean, there's one mm. place that just looks so like, what, what how do I where do I begin? Because there's fabric all over. <laughs> it's messy, but you have to dig and find. And then there could be another location where it's all nicely organized and it's easy. Like they have like taffeta, satin, and you know it's all labeled. But yeah, I mean it's it's everywhere. You know, city to city or uh, website. You could just Google what you want, then you'll find your source. Sounds like there's a lot more variety in yeah. outlying areas in the metropolitan area up here in Colorado. The fabric stores, there just are very few. The only <laughs> one that is fantastic is something, uh, a small store that's been around for, God, 75 years uh, that deals primarily in very elite bridal and quite fancy mm -hmm. fabrics and going in there i don't dare go because i want to buy something and then yeah <laughs> I'm not sewing <laughs> i'm in trouble so so i i go infrequently <laughs> but i want to steer our conversation to something that is not as nice but talks about uh the community and how Contemporary fashion often is not ecologically correct. Contemporary fashion can be a um, problem for the environment, problem for uh, workers. And obviously the two of you don't have that because everything is a piece of art that creates it, its own place. And as Felix says, you once you have created it, you give its spirit to the person who has purchased it. But tell us about your take on what's happening in just ordinary clothing design today in this regard, please. Felix, maybe um, you can start yeah, on that okay, one because so, that's, it's a tough subject. Mm -hmm. yeah, it is, it, it is a really tough subject. Um, I am actually pretty big on this um, when it comes uh, to my, my work and my designing. Um, I've actually been approached um, twice by um, outside sources to um, to design for uh, a well known um, a well known brand, and I guess in a way they are they're looking for their token Native American to you know um, you know just even just that to you know looking looking going that route you know looking for their token Native American to slap the name on, a, on an already established brand and then to sell it, you know, uh, and um, things like that and, you know, send it into mass production, things like that. I've been approached twice, actually, I really recently, right before the pandemic, um, I got, was approached with that notion. And um, I thought I kind of just would, you know, see how far I actually would get with it just to, you know, I already knew that, okay, I, I'm, this is something that I don't want to do. Um, but I, you know, I went as far as just, they're like, you know, throw us a number. And I was like, well, what do you mean? They're like, just throw us a number. What would you be comfortable with? And I was just like, all right, the, these guys are pretty well known. They're pretty big. So I threw them, I was like 250. And then they were just like, you know, they're like, oh, okay. Yeah, that's, you know, that's, they're like, oh, that's cool. You know, that I don't know. I was like, oh, shoot, did I, did I shoot too low? <laughs> 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 so but you know and that's as far as it got but I did my research and um, a lot of the the um the the contracting that they that they that that company did for their their um their company um was of course outsourced to um third world countries um if you will and then uh, and all that other stuff you know it's just like you know that's really something that I don't want to do that I never wanted to do so um when it comes to my my clothing, uh, my 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 uh, clothing label. I that's something I really just, you know, as I gotten older and really just become more conscious about the environment. I always was really conscious about the environment ever since I was a little kid because I love animals so much and like you know the rainforest has always intrigued me and I was so in awe and amazed by like all the birds and the animals and the oceans and all that stuff when I was a little kid. So I did know about you know environmental destruction when I was a really tiny kid. I think I was like in 
third grade, I used to get those little tiny zoo, those zoo book uh, magazines. I, you know, just begged my grandmother to get a subscription and she did. And from that, I learned about, you know, deforestation and uh, chemical, you know, um, um, you know, chemicals being spilled out into the ocean and things like that. So I always was aware of it. But as I got older, I've become in a way a bit of an, an activist. Um, and um, that is something that I hold dear to my heart and something that a direction I definitely will not take. Um, I do realize that, you know, nobody can be 100%, but I always say that, you know, if you start somewhere and um, that's the best that we can do and then work your way up from there. So, but uh, yeah, it's a really big issue for me. So um, I do take in consideration you know, the environment, um, social awareness, and all these other things when it comes to labor, things like that. Um, and then also, you know, um, the, one of the biggest topics right now is, um, is appropriations of culture and, you know, and, um, you know, and knowledge and things like that. So combining all those things together, you know, just looking at it and just being aware and I always tell people just, you know, the best thing for you, anyone to do is just to research and, and study and know those things, you know, could, you know, um, gain that knowledge. Um, I say, and, and when it comes to appropriations, um, I'm not one to jump on everything as being appropriative or having appropriative qualities because I still believe as human beings that we should inspire in one another. But when that does happen, we should create some sort of synergy between um, each uh, between each of us, you know, cultures, race, whatever what have you. We should be able to do that and continue to inspire one another. Um, um, so that's how I look at it, um, because I I get inspired by all different people across the universe and around the world, and I find like every culture, I find beauty in everything. Mm -hmm. So, and I also find similarities in a lot of the cultures around the world. Like, you know, I, I always tell people, like, doesn't the the um, the chief blankets the Navajos have made so famous? I was like, doesn't that look African to you guys? And then people would be like, <laughs> yeah. no, really. Like, I, I, it, looks, it looks like it, it came out of somewhere like from Africa. I was like, it's so beautiful to me, and you know, things like that. I like to look for similarities in things like that. And I think those are the things that combine us or that connect us and, you know, and, and, and trigger those, trigger those urges or those, those things of being inspired. So, but yeah, it is, there's a, so much when it comes to fashion. And then also, you know, fast fashion. Yeah. Um, that's just one thing that I will not do that I don't want to do ever. So, and, um, yeah, so that's, that's my take on that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, Penny, you you would certainly agree that the one needle tailoring uh, is what makes you the artist. And yet, what about the fabrics themselves, the the materials of the fabrics, the dyes, um, uh, bringing back this idea of um, how how is the actual making of fabric um good for the environment, bad for the environment? What do you think uh, your research has taught you there? Well, with, with myself, I don't do any dye-in in fabrics. I just, you know, stick to the same material I've always used. And um, I mean, going along behind the material or the dyes, I've not really looked into it or researched it, but I, I know it's quality because where I get it, it's um, a source where other um, tailors, you know, get their material. And, and like for myself, I, you know, I'm very cautious of materials. And like I said, I don't, you know, dye anything. I'm not very mass produced person. I like to keep my stuff limited in additions. Um, and as far as the other thing that I do is I upcycle. Like, um, like when I'm wearing the jacket, this is something I bought, you know, a while back ago I, I I get like you know um like uh like nice you know suits or like the jacket I'm wearing and I jazz it up when I say jazz it up that's when I put stuff on it 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's how I upcycle and recycle. One thing I can actually say is like what I do, uh, like men's shirts, ribbon shirts, and I apple them and put work on them. But at one point, I just couldn't keep up with the production of my shirts because I individually make them, cut them, and, you know, and make them. So I found a place where I could find some good, you know, quality dress shirts name brand shirts but you know to do that I had to clean them you know I I would wash them or get them clean press them out make them look as new and I would put um designs on them so those were my upcycle shirts so that's kind of how I think of the environment now I'm very um resourceful I you know I don't want to you know do too much you know, and as far as the upcycle shirts that I'm talking about, those were really, uh, men really liked them because they were more fitted. When I make the ribbon shirts, they were more loose fitted. That's kind of like the native style, you know, it's, 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 it's handmade and that's kind of, you know, how we would make the shirts. But these shirts were more tailored, you know, custom fit, nice, you know, everything, but I just jazz them up, put work on them. And I do that to the denim jackets too. So um, as far as, you know, the environment and how I go uh, approach stuff is, I'm just one person that just loves what I do. You know, it's in limited um, qu- um, quantities. It's like, I can't make a jacket and make five of them. I did that once before and it was a lot of work. Um, <laughs> But, you know, they're just custom made, you know, I love what I do. It's all wearable art, you know, I just, just, just like to be real. And, you know, I love doing art shows. So that's pretty much my source of where people can come see me. You know, people ask about my site and this and that. And I just tell them I can't, I can't keep up with demand. I can't like make a jacket and put it up on site because I'll, you know, somebody's going to want a different size or they want it tailored and I can't do that you know, because I got shows after shows, which I love to do. And I love to communicate with new people and clients and this and that. And I love, I just love being around art. And a lot of them are, you know, it's like a one big family. And that's kind of like, you know, where I'm at with, with my clothing. I'm just. I like the word real. (laughs) I'm going to put up a, I'm going to put up a, a picture just kind of because we're doing this topic. Uh-huh. of bringing Miss Millicent into this is the kind of iconic picture Miss Millicent is <laughs> dying oh, okay. velvet oh yeah I see it standing at standing at the stove right in mm-hmm. her um skirt and looks like velvet blouse but mm-hmm. she did the same thing kind of that you know, I'm glad you talked the way you did, um, Felix, about appropriation and people inspiring each other. And those are such difficult conversations to have. And we certainly have those conversations at the museum, you know, quite often. And um, I think there is something to be said about just interacting and having human exchanges and inspiring each other. And I want to just um, circle back a little bit to your comment about sometimes you said, sometimes I just have this itch that I want to put some beauty out there. And I think a lot of people could relate to that. And, you know, just really finding meaning in every single thing you do, both of you, both of you demonstrate that and share that and live that. And I wonder if you want to speak at all about the beauty way either one of you that searching like looking for beauty and that all of life is beauty Mm -hmm. um well um i know that um to the outside world that that phrase you know walking beauty or beauty way Mm -hmm. is really really synonymous with the Diné people Mm -hmm. um i know it's it's plastered on everything everywhere you go um so for me, I, for me, it's about balance, mm-hmm. you know, because um, I, was, I was brought up um, uh, traditionally and then also a lot of with the ancestral knowledge that the Diné people have, that my, my parents had, my grandmothers, my grandfathers had. And the way I, the way I was 
taught and the way I approach um, just, uh, you know, seeing beauty, creating it for me is really just finding some sort of medium and finding a balance to, to do those things and approach those things. Um, because um, the way I was taught in Diné is um, too much beauty also can be destructive. Mm. Um, uh, and in Diné culture and Diné life ways, we're taught that there's a there's there's this balance that should be that should be that we should have with beauty and chaos and mm -hmm. um, um, so when you when we say beauty way in Diné we say hajonje. And then there's actually another branch to the net life ways, which we call is the protection way, which consists of things that are, you know, like, like, like destruction, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, um, and just, you know, the end to things, you know, but that's part of life. You know, we're, we're, we're taught that in the net. My grandmother taught that. Or she was talked to us a lot about that. You have to have both, she would say. You know, we just can't be like beauty way, beauty way, beauty way, and right. you don't need that and just she's up because that will create an imbalance and that also can become very destructive. So for me, it's about creating that balance, having that balance and understanding actually how the whole cycle of life works. You know, mm -hmm. my grandmother would say there is no such thing as new energy. She's like, all this energy that we have now was created way back. And when she would state, like, you know, consciousness is where it all began. You know, there was consciousness, and then there was a huge, there was like a, there was this a blackness, and then there was a spark in that blackness. It was the tiniest thing. But, you know, and I was thinking, like, was she talking about the Big Bang Theory? Is that what we're, we're talking? She was, you know, but she would mention things like that. She, so all that energy was created at that time. So now, today, it's just a transfer of energy now. So in order for me to live and exist right now and be speaking and talking to you, to everyone right now and you guys and you mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. is there has to be an ending to something else somewhere. So that energy is, is what I'm using up right now. At one point in my life, I'm going to go back to old age. That's a goal for me because in Diné, that's our goal is to return to old age. When that time comes, my energy will go elsewhere to give something or someone else to be able to live and to see what I've seen and, and things like that. So for me, it is really about creating that balance. So thank you so much for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Last word, Penny. <laughs> We're about out of time. <laughs> you you get to have the last comment. <laughs> well, what what do you want to like what for the what beauty? Um, or what? Yes. Uh, well, every artist. Is I'd also like to encourage people, if anybody has any questions, because we are running out of time, to put them in the Q and A, um, and we'll try to. Oh, okay. So, well, for my last words, I'd just like to thank you, Karen, Sarah, for inviting me for to this panel, and Felix, thank you for being here. You're awesome designer. You know, you. love your work. You know, you're you're a great person, great artist. And, you know, that's pretty much all I can say. You know, I mean, you know, just see you at the next show or at the next panel. Yeah. Thank you mm -hmm. so much for, Thank you. Thank for you. participating Thank you. with us. And I just want to ask if, if people wanted to um, contact you or are interested in your designs, where would... Penny, your website, right? Yeah, and just go to my website. I'm on social media. I've been like on the down low for a while, but um, yeah. you know, now you know I'm gonna start um, traveling much more. But yeah, social social media, my website, or <laughs> other magazines. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Felix and you. Um, yeah, um, you can uh, contact me through social media. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter, uh, Twitter too, but not too often. Um, but that account is there and again, it exists. And then it was really crazy because the other day, I just out of curiosity, I Googled Earl Couture 
and my my MySpace page is still up. <laughs> that was pretty crazy. I was like, what? <laughs> Cool. Well, yeah, I mean, you can also just Google my name and you'll just find things. Yeah. And maybe soon I'll be on TikTok. Oh, geez. you know, I'm, yeah. I'm waiting. You know, yeah. I mean, there's a You're different doing way some of kind of dance TikTok. on TikTok. Yeah. yeah. TikTok looks fun, but I, I'm, <laughs> I'm ready. I think I'm ready. I like well, the camera. I like you. the talk. Thank you, everybody. And I just want to say as we wrap it up um, that next month, Sarah and I will be. Um, hosting a Millicent Unplugged program called From the Ground Up, From Seeds to Solar Ovens. So I'll just leave it at that. And um, thank you again to our guests. And I will be um, putting this recording on our YouTube and I will send it out. And then it's also available on demand for 30 days um, for people nice. who want to, you know, you can still continue to share the link and people can access it. Okay. All right. Thank you Thank so you. much. Have a good evening. It was well. Bye. Bye. Thank you for having us. You guys have a good night. Bye-bye.